He said, to the extent I desire to move through you, you must allow me to cut on you. The Leader's Cut. What's up, everybody? Welcome to The Leader's Cut, especially if this is your first time joining the conversation. What's going on? Great to have you in the fold. Uh, we love to have an honest conversation that's going to require vulnerability on both our parts before the Lord, not just before one another, but also it's going to require that each of us be willing to lie down on the surgeon's table, the divine surgeon of heaven, the spirit of the living God, so that he might cut off any part of our flesh that's getting in the way of his spirit and how his spirit is wanting to move in us and through us. That's why we call it the leader's cut. Uh, as you can see from the thumbnail, we're talking about uh, something that might be a little bit hard to discuss today. And so I, I want you to enter this conversation with purity of heart. If, if there was a name that you immediately thought of, uh, and it wasn't the Holy Spirit bringing the name to your remembrance when you read the thumbnail about what we're talking about today, uh, I, I want you to kind of just set that down. All right. Don't come into this conversation thinking about a specific person. Come into this conversation focused on God and his ways. This conversation is not about anybody specific in your life or mine. This conversation is about God's principles to help us navigate relationally difficult seasons. All right, let's pray. We'll jump into it. We got a lot of ground to cover. This one might be a little longer than normal. All right, God, thank you so much for my brothers and sisters. I am so grateful to be a part of this family. <laughs> it's still mind-blowing to me that you allow me to be a part of the greatest family in the history of humanity, your family. And Holy Spirit, I pray right now, wherever my brother is, wherever my sister is, no matter what they're doing right now, Spirit of the living God, I pray you would rest in this place and in that place wherever they are right now. Holy Spirit, we ask you, we beg of you to pull up a chair, a seat at our table. We want to hear your heart. We want to be more like Jesus. Holy Spirit, would you help us in this conversation? Pray that you'd touch the hearts of those who've been hurt by a close friend or family member. And you'd not allow the enemy. I just pray a hedge of protection over their minds and hearts, especially during this conversation, so that the enemy would not be allowed to wreak havoc in their hearts or minds, distracting them or getting them to tune out of this divine conversation I believe you want them to have for the good of a very important relationship in their lives. So Holy Spirit, would you please just do what you do? Because we can't do what you do but we love to see you do what you do. So would you just let her rip? Do whatever you want. Say whatever you want in this conversation. Would you grant me a measure of access to your wisdom that I've never been allowed to access before? Not so that they can think I'm something, but simply so that you could use me to help them using something that could only come from you. All these things I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, peeps, let's get to work. All right. Uh, tons of ground to cover. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't enumerate these things, so I don't even actually know how many things uh, we're going to cover, but I just know we're covering a lot of ground. All right. So as we talk about navigating difficult relational seasons, um, I think it's, it's important to start with the right baseline, all right? First thing we need to talk about is we need to understand why Satan loves division. Satan absolutely, certifiably loves division. He loves it when there is relational separation between you and a friend or a family member. He loves it. And I'm going to help you understand why, but I want to paint a picture so you can see how nasty and evil and cunning he is as he seeks to divide us 
from one another. When I was in college, my freshman year, lived in the dorms, and there was one guy uh, who we called him the hazer. And, and here's why. It wasn't, he wasn't hazing like we might think uh, that term would imply. Here's what he would do. He, he would incite relational riots. Like he would, he loved to see fights. So he would, there's one guy on our floor who, whose buttons were easiest to push. He would push that guy's buttons and get that guy to end up picking fights with people three times stronger than him. And he'd start yelling, just, just agging it on. And what was going to happen? There was going to be a period of relational separation because that's what a fight creates, right? Satan is that hazer. He is that one in the middle trying to push your buttons, push the buttons of the other person so that the two of you will create relational separation. And here's what you've got to be mindful of. The extent to which Satan goes to break up a relationship is the extent of his fear if those two stand strong together. Don't take Satan's bait. He loves it when we're divided. And he loves it when we're the ones doing the bulk of the heavy lifting. Now, question. Why does Satan love division so much? I think there's an there's actually a very clear reason in scripture why Satan loves division as much as he does. Here it is. Because division is the fastest way to slow down multiplication. Watch this. Go back to the garden. Genesis 1, verse 28. What does God say? He says, be fruitful and multiply. This is the command given to man. Come together and multiply. It can't be fruitful apart from one another. Come together and multiply. And then goes on to dominion. Here's my perspective. I think the second Satan heard God say, multiply, Satan went, if that's your play, here's my play. Division. Eve, come here. The second God told man to multiply is the exact moment Satan went to work to divide. As we talk about relational separation, division, I need you to understand how much Satan loves it. He loves division. And part of the reason I'm trying to help you understand this is so that you'll get to a place where you'll go, wait a minute, if Satan loves something, I don't want to love it. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. I don't want you loving something Satan loves, and he loves division. John Calvin said it like this. He said, among Christians, there ought to be so great a dislike of schism as that they may always avoid it so fast as lies in their power. Such a great dime. Paraphrase, Christians should hate division. And they should hate it so much that the minute they see it, they, they try to do something about it. Satan loves division. Now, the other side of that coin, we need to understand why God hates division. Yes, God absolutely, certifiably hates division. If you don't understand God's hatred for division, chances are you'll be too comfortable dabbling in it. And I want to show you two passages of scripture. One, that if, if you didn't understand how much God hates division, you could just simply read 1 Corinthians 1.10 and be like, oh, yeah, I get it. Okay, I'll try. Let me read it to you. And then let me read you another passage out of Proverbs 6 to help calibrate your thinking about how to see passages like 1 Corinthians 1.10. Paul says, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, I appeal to you, dear brothers and sisters, by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ, to live in harmony with each other. Let there be no divisions in the church. Rather, be of one mind, united in thought and purpose. Now, if you don't understand that God hates division, in your heart, you might read this verse like this. Let there be no division. As though it's kind of saying, come on, guys. Can't we all just get along? 
If you don't understand how badly God hates division, I think it might cause you to misread and misinterpret passages on division. So let's look at Proverbs chapter 6, verses 16, 17, 18, and 19. There are six things the Lord hates. No, seven things he detests. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that kill the innocent, a heart that plots evil, feet that race to do wrong, a false witness who pours out lies, a person who sows discord in a family. Why does God hate someone who sows discord in a family? Because discord creates division. Because God hates division, he hates when someone sows discord. Because discord always leads to division, to a divide. Your personal understanding of God's hatred for division is directly connected to how unwaveringly and unapologetically you will fight for unity. Listen, when you love someone, you love what they love. God hates division because he loves unity. And this is a picture I just recently got walking through, and this is the way relationships go, walking through a relationship that was going through some curveballs. I felt the Lord give me a picture. When you're in a season of relational separation from a brother or sister, understand how every day, every one of your days begins with God at some point saying, Preston, I seriously hate this. I do not like this relational separation. I am not a fan of this. I'm not for this. I hate this. Hey, what would it change about the burden you carry to mend offense relationally with one you love? If you knew, every day of separation began with God saying, just want you to know, just want to remind you how I feel about all this. I hate this. I do not like when two of my children are separated relationally. Now, <clears throat> to really get a burden for this, uh, I want to paint a picture for you, okay? If your spouse had been in an emotionally abusive previous marriage and she said to you, listen, there's something I hate. I hate hearing the word divorce thrown around like a threat. In my previous marriage, my husband would constantly throw around divorce as a threat if I didn't do this, this, and this. And every time I hear the word divorce thrown out in a fight, it literally makes my entire being shut down. I hate it. Okay, question. If you really love that person, would you ever even say that word? If it was a painful trigger for them, would you even say it? If they told you, I hate it. Okay, listen, God tells us in his word, I hate division. Preston, I am bothered with you when you not just allow discord, but anytime you sow seeds of discord, Preston, I hate it because I hate division. Okay. When he talks like that, shouldn't we respond in an equitable manner based off the strength of his tone? When he gets strong with me, the stronger he gets with me about something, the more inclined I am to immediately do something about it passionately. I'm not just going to be like, oh, Okay, let there be no division among us. No, when I catch that burden, Preston, I hate it. Okay, well, because I love you, I hate what you hate. I love what you love. In this case, unity, I hate what you hate. Satan loves division. I never want to love what he loves. God hates division. I never want to love what God hates. This is the way we must enter this conversation about Division, all right? Now, let's get a little more personal. Uh, and not that personal means less spiritual. But let's really drive this Mack truck into the cul-de-sac of your heart. Third thing we need to talk about. If you're going to navigate relational hardship, 
in a godly manner, you're going to have to leave room for humanity. We are humans. You got to leave room for humanity. Now, having said that, I am not in any way saying that you need to uh, leave room for humanity. And that therefore means you're giving someone license to hurt you. No, that's not leaving room for humanity. It's not what it means. It means to understand that the person you're experiencing separation from is a human. And so are you. Here's something else I want us to remember before we jump into talking about making room for humanity. While we should leave room for humanity, we should never dwell on their humanity. Dwelling on the humanity of someone you're frustrated with can quickly lead to hating the human with the bad habits. If you fixate on all the wrong they're doing, you're just going to eventually hate them. Think about how we talk in situations like this. I hate it when so-and-so does that. I hate it when so And how quickly does hating what they do when we're focused on what they did lead to hating the person who did it? Leave room for humanity, but never dwell on their humanity. I want to I wanna give you a passage uh, that I think is just absolutely gangster in this part of the conversation where Paul, one of the most savage followers of Jesus, who has ever lived, in my opinion, it is on a run talking about his own humanity and helping us understand ours. It's Romans chapter 7, verses 14 and 15. Paul says, and, and this is the middle of the conversation. I know I'm, I'm stepping right into the middle. He says, so the trouble is not with the law, the rules, for it's spiritual and good. The trouble is with me. Watch, he tells us why. For I am all too human, a slave to sin. I don't really understand myself. Talk about self-awareness. For I want to do what is right but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. This is a calibrating passage as we talk about leaving room in our relationships for humanity. Have you ever done something you wish you wouldn't have done? Has it ever hurt someone you love? I'm not saying there's an excuse for it and, and that my humanity is an excuse for the hurt I cause, but what I am saying is we all have to remember that in the same way I'm human and there are times, just like with Paul, that I do things that I hate, that I can't stand. That, that very same thing is true of the person I'm separated from relationally. They're human too. Never ever forget, a relationship absent of grace is a relationship devoid of God. You can't have a godly friendship without grace. Giving them what they don't deserve. Knowing what their humanity, their frailty, their mistake, which hurt you. Listen, what does grace say? I know what all that deserves, but I'm going to give you what you don't deserve. We live in this day where cancel culture it's making me sick. This, this whole thing that everyone is just one sentence away, one misstep away from being permanently canceled. This is the most godless thing I've ever heard of. Please hear my heart, okay? I'm, I'm not trying to make allowance for any of us who overstep a boundary. But I am trying to remind all of us that we walk with a God who said of a man who didn't just have an affair, but he had the spouse of the woman he had an affair with murdered. And he still said, this is a man after my own heart. I'm not telling you I fully understand it. You know you're getting closer to the grace of God the more you realize you can't wrap your limited mind around his unmerited favor unlimited grace 
cancel culture is the literal antithesis, in my opinion, of how God rolls. Cancel culture is the evidence of a graceless society. Is that how we're going to roll as the church? Again, I'm not saying we should make excuses for people. Not at all. But I am saying scripture does not say we should cancel our brothers and sisters when they sin and repent. It says we should cover them. Again, not hide the sin. Cover the sinner who's human. Like Paul. And from time to time does things they hate. Let me help you understand something. If you don't leave room for humanity, you're merely making more room for hurt. Literally. If you don't leave room for humanity in your relationships with humans, you're just making room for more hurt. And one of the evidences of that hurt is bitterness. Bitterness rests in the heart of one who hopes for perfection from one who is imperfect. And that leads to the next thing we got to talk about. If we're going to navigate relationally difficult seasons in a godly manner, it's this. You got to look for roots of bitterness. You got to look for roots of bitterness. What is bitterness? Bitterness is anger and disappointment from feeling unfairly treated. Let me show you how powerful bitterness is. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 14 and 15 says, work at living in peace with everyone. What a great start. And work at living a holy life. The two go hand in hand, by the way. Living in peace with others, living a holy life. Go hand in hand. For those who are not holy will not see the Lord. Look after each other so that none of you fails to receive the grace of God. Watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you, corrupting many. This picture right here is filthy. That the root of bitterness doesn't just hurt the person who has it. It actually spreads and corrupts many. One person's root of bitterness, anger and disappointment from feeling unfairly treated, is so powerful that it doesn't just corrupt the one who has it. Its roots are so strong and pervasive that it corrupts many along with them. How do you know, Preston, that you have a root of bitterness? I'll tell you one of the easiest ways to know you have a root of bitterness I'd say it like this. One of the ways you know you have a root of bitterness towards someone is if the people closest to you carry your burden of bitterness even more bitterly than you do. I've noticed this with my wife. My wife is a gangster. Literally. Girl didn't play two sports in college by being weak sauce. She's tough. And she's a protector. She's she's a mama hen, even with me. And so if she feels I'm being attacked, that girl will, will rise up. And I've learned one of the ways that I have a root of bitterness is if my wife has in her a root of bitterness towards the same person. This is what you got to know about root systems. Root systems always spread. And the root of bitterness spreads as fast as any root system in the world. Bitterness is one of the most dangerous weeds in the garden of your life. So you need to be on the lookout for it. Look out for that anger or disappointment that starts rising up in you towards someone because you feel unfairly treated by them. There's no way to live. Bitterness is one of the most miserable ways to live. Here's why. Because the enemy always uses bitterness to make you more miserable 
than the one you're bitter towards. Satan just uses it to mess with you. Bitterness is a wide open door to your heart. And every time we carry a root of bitterness, I think Satan's like, hey, thank you very much. Appreciate this. Making my job easy, Preston. Thank you. Let me say it like this. Bitterness is a doormat for Satan to enter into all of my heart, not just the part of my heart involved in this relationship. This is serious business. I remember that commercial back in the day. Some of you are not old enough to have ever seen this commercial. I don't even remember what company it was that did this commercial, but they called it the bitter beer face commercials. You remember those of you who are, are at least as old as me and this, this guy would have this apparently nasty bitter beer and, and his whole face would like scrunch up like, like one of those puppies, you know, uh, but it's not a Sherpa. I don't, I don't even remember what kind of puppy it is. We know what I'm talking about. Just a bunch of wrinkles and just bitter beer face. Okay, question. If that's what bitterness looks like, that scrunchy faced heart, here's my question. How can anybody see clearly the person standing in front of them when in their heart they're like this? This is what bitterness does to our our hearts. It causes me not to be able to see you the way God sees you as you stand right in front of me. Yet many of us keep swallowing the pill of bitterness, hoping it's going to help. And I will tell you, from experience, going back many years ago, Bitterness in your heart will never make things better in your life. Here's the next extremely practical thing we need to talk about. If we're going to navigate relational hardship in a godly manner. We talked about leaving room for humanity. Now I want to talk to you about something we're not to leave any room for. Gossip. Don't leave any room for gossip. Have you ever met someone who was constantly talking about the one they feel hurt them? You ever, ever, ever been around that person or even better, been that person? Their name is just constantly coming out of your mouth no matter who you're sitting with. And then, and then they'll say something like this, but I'm good though. I'm good. They can't hurt me anymore. And yet you keep talking about them. You keep uttering their name time and time again in a variety of conversations. Why? It's just evidence there is hurt and you haven't been able to be healed of the hurt. Gossip is one of the ways we know there is something deeper in our hearts about the person we are gossiping about. And it's deep, so deep in our hearts, we, I'm not even sure we realize how bad it is. Let me show you, though, how dangerous gossip is in a relationship. Proverbs 16, 28. A troublemaker plants seeds of strife, discord. Gossip separates the best of friends. Check that out. Gossip separates best friends simply talking negatively behind their back. The Bible says has the power to separate even the best of friends. Who are you talking about? Who are you having a hard time getting their name out your mouth? And then you need to figure out why. Because if I were the enemy trying to break up the family of God and cause the, the name of God and the family of God to lose respect, you know what I would do? I would just try and stir up a bunch of gossip among believers. <laughs> I'd be curious to know from God's perspective, what percentage of social media comments are gossip? 
these back and forths online. I wonder how much of it is godly and how much of it is gossip. Question, why would I want anything to do with anything that could separate me and all my best friends? And God goes on record and says, Preston, I need you to understand the power of gossip. It'll separate the best of friends. You love Timmy? Lord, you know I love Timmy. Preston, gossip can kill your relationship with your best friend. Okay, Lord, that sounds serious. Son, it is. It's even worse than, than someone who sows strife or discord, Preston. Gossip is powerful. And it never leads to anything good. Can I just make a, a sweet little boy request? Can we please stop talking negatively about the people we love behind their back? My thing is, if you're not willing to say it to their face, don't say it behind their back. That's how you know it's gossip. Listen, and I, I, this is part of the reason why I'm kind of known for being willing to say hard things and, and hard truths. Because in my heart, I, I've tried to make a commitment before the Lord. I'm not saying it behind your back. If I feel it and I believe it's true, I love you too much to talk about it behind your back and run the risk of losing our friendship. I'll just say it right to you. There, there's a, a verse that's calibrated me over the years because listen, totally forthright, totally transparent. I used to struggle with gossip when I was in my early 20s. One of the ways we know we're, we're battling insecurity is we talk negatively about everyone else behind their back. Shots fired. That was at myself first, not at you. I learned it the hard way. I was so utterly insecure. And one of the ways I realized I was uber insecure is because I was talking negatively about everybody behind their back more than anybody else in my life. Let me show you a verse. Ecclesiastes 10 verse 20. Never make light of the king, even in your thoughts. And don't make fun of the powerful, even in your own bedroom. For a little birdie might deliver your message and tell them what you said. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell them myself, all right? I'm going to tell you how and when I learned this in my life. I've gone on record when I was in my early 20s, very unhealthy. Pastor Robert had hired me. The church was exploding. I was not growing nearly at the rate the church was. And uh, so I was just, I was bitter about everything. I was bitter towards Pastor Robert. I was extremely unhealthy. I was bitter towards the Lord. I was just ticked at everyone. And um, there are times where I would say something that was dishonoring about Pastor Robert behind his back. I don't like hearing myself say that. But for the better part of probably two years, which at that point was 10% of my life to that point, I was, because I was so hurt and not doing anything to get healed of the hurt, um, from time to time I would say negative things about Pastor Robert behind his back. And I didn't realize there was something that was happening causing me stress and until the Lord revealed it, I didn't understand why I was so stressed by it. Back in the day, Pastor Robert would text me every once in a while, or he would call just out of nowhere, maybe to go to the boat show, it may be to grab lunch, da, 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 whatever. But I didn't know what it was. And you know, I have my phone set up where if you text me, I see your name, but I, I can't read the message. And every time he would text me or call me, my heart would start racing extremely fast. And I didn't understand why it was happening. I thought I had some fear of being fired, you know, which I had a little bit just from insecurity, but it was, it was deeper than that. It wasn't until the Lord helped me understand Ecclesiastes 10, 20. Preston, every time he calls you, you see his name on your phone, your heart races 
Because without even realizing it, you're afraid a little birdie told him what you said behind his back. I remember being so dadgum dumbfounded by this. I mean, it was an aha moment where it was like, wait a minute. I don't like being stressed like this. I don't like assuming he's about to tell me something terrible because of something terrible I did or said behind his back. I don't want to live like this anymore. And it's like the Lord goes, then stop dishonoring him by gossiping behind his back, Preston. I wonder how many relational fences could be mended faster if we would just stop talking about each other behind one another's backs. Listen, you can, you can keep walking around telling all of us, I'm fine, I'm good. What they did didn't hurt me. I will tell you from experience, the more their name comes out your mouth, the more hurt you have in your heart from them. Whether it's justified or not, Don't make room for gossip. Don't let it come out of your mouth. So ungodly and so powerful in an evil way. Don't do it. Don't take the bait. Build up. Don't tear down. Don't do the job of the enemy for him. Okay, so we got gossip, which is kind of the negative side of conversation and the easiest path the easiest easiest path of communication is just to talk behind someone's back it it, it does nothing good for the relationship doesn't build it it actually tears it down and can tear it apart completely scripture is saying so you got the negative side of communication which is the easy path communicatively how about that for a word here's the other side of the coin courageous conversations Don't make room for gossip so that you can make more room for embracing courageous conversations. And here's my advice. And I'm going to explain what a courageous conversation is. But here's what I would say. Embrace courageous conversations when there's relational separation in a relationally hard season. Embrace courageous conversations sooner rather than later. What's a courageous conversation, Preston? Here's, Timmy and I have been teaching this for years, okay? A courageous conversation is one filled with truth and doused in love. That's what a courageous conversation is. One of the fastest ways to set a relationship back on the right track is with the truth. But that always takes courage to talk about. Proverbs chapter 27, verse 6 is the calibrating verse for me as it relates to courageous conversations and relationships. Wounds from a sincere friend are better than many kisses from an enemy. Hard, hard words to stomach. Press and just know it's better for you to feel a wound from a sincere friend telling you the truth than for your enemy to kiss you a thousand times, lying to you. That's, that's the implication here, the inference. How's a wound created from a sincere friend? With the truth. What's a kiss from an enemy? A lie. When they lie to you. Tell you what you want to hear. Which would you rather? Would you rather be wounded by a sincere friend and experience the growth that comes as a result of it and embracing the truth that God's using them to make you aware of? Or would you rather just have a bunch of people around you who lie to you, daily making you worse? Here's, I want to give you a piece of advice because courageous conversations are something that I kind of have to have on a, on a fairly consistent basis and, and that have to be had with me. So I've learned a little bit about courageous conversations over the years. First, let me help you understand. You can't have a healthy relationship without courageous conversations. There, let's talk marriage. There is no such thing 
as a healthy marriage that doesn't consistently and frequently talk about the truth, especially when it's the elephant in the room. You can't, can't have a godly marriage without consistent, courageous conversation. Let me give you a couple of things just to think about if you're going to, going to begin embracing more courageous conversations. Before you have a courageous conversation with somebody else, let me help you understand what will help you. Let the Lord have a courageous conversation with you before you have a courageous conversation with them. I'll tell you from experience, you will not be firm with them. Because I know you've been heard and it's easy to get into a courageous conversation that's supposed to involve the truth. And then, then instead of you know, wounding them with the truth, we wound them with a hard phrase or a shot fired. Yeah, the easiest way not to go into a courageous conversation too firmly is to let the Lord have a courageous conversation with you before you even have a conversation which needs courage with them. Here's something else I'd tell you. Uh, one of the, in my opinion, uh, better ways uh, to have a courageous conversation is to always kick off the conversation with honor, not dishonor. When I was younger and I would have courageous conversations that needed to be had in a relationship where I had experienced pain, typically my first move was to, to dishonor. I can't believe you did this. And that makes you this kind of person because only this kind of person would do something like that, what you did to me. You start off with dishonor. <laughs> Question, how many conversations do you have which start off with dishonor that ever end up well? The fastest way to make somebody defensive is to dishonor them from jump. And I, honestly, I don't know if reconciliation is what you're going for, if your first move is to dishonor them to their face. I don't care how badly you've been hurt. Again, I'm not talking about abuse. I'm talking about the normal uh, habits of unfortunately crossing a line, saying something that shouldn't have been said, doing things that shouldn't have been done. And I'm not talking about abuse, all right? I'm talking about the normal relational stuff we all do and endure, okay? I don't know that you can say you want reconciliation if your first step is to dishonor them to their face. One of the wisest pieces of advice I could give you is to create a safe place for a hard conversation by always starting the conversation with honor. Now, one of my heroes who taught me this is Pastor Tom Lane. This, this episode of Sesame Street is brought to you by Pastor Tom Lane. Yes, I bring his name up all the time. I'm not going to stop. I don't care what anyone says. I love this man. And, and if you don't follow him, I've been telling you for some time now uh, on Instagram. I think it's at P.S. Tom Lane, uh, ELI, Executive Leadership Institute. Uh, make sure you're watching his clips on YouTube. They're a little more long, long form than his reels on Instagram. Uh, Preston, why are you pushing Pastor Tom? Uh, well, I'm not really pushing him. I'm trying to help you. Big difference. I really appreciate when, when some of you show the love towards me that you're showing. It, it means a lot to me, and I mean that from the bottom of my heart. But I'm not sure you always understand how badly I want to help you. And one of the ways I know I can help you is make sure you have access, even if from afar, to some of the people who help me become me. I'm not talking about become me, like I'm some kind of something. I'm talking about become me. Become me. And Pastor Tom's one of those people. And one of the things he taught me 
was courageous conversations must always begin with honor. I have never met anyone who does this better than Tom. It, one of the kind of running jokes, and I don't mean in a disparaging way, but, but one of kind of the running uh, lines about Tom is, Tom has an anointing to spank you and hug you simultaneously, and you walk out after the spanking thinking more about the hug than the whooping. <laughs> I mean, the man, the man's a legend. And part of the reason why is every time he would spank me because of something stupid I did or said, he would always start off with honor, honor, honor. And you're like, oh my goodness, this, this feels so wonderful to be seen and to be loved. And then whack. <laughs> and then love and honor. I'm telling you right now, you might be really intimidated of courageous conversations, but if you start them with honor, I'm telling you, they will be easier to have. Having to tell the truth, relay the truth about someone you love in your life is never easy. But the easiest way to disarm them and help them not to become defensive is to honor them. You want them to be defensive and turn it into a fight? Start with dishonor. You want it to be a healthy conversation? Start it with honor. Here's the next thing. And this is another one of the really practical ones. Okay. And again, this came from me learning the hard way. Don't let winning be your highest goal. In relational conflict, if you set winning as your number one goal, you run the risk of losing the relationship. And, and here's what I would say. Only people who feel like they're always losing feel like they always must win. Telling you from experience. I used to think every conversation I would get into was an opportunity to win. Want to know why I felt that way? Because I thought I was losing more than everybody else. And I needed to make up for lost ground. So I had to win every conversation, every argument. Here's what I learned. It's actually impossible to win whenever your friend loses. Question, if I love my wife, why would I ever want her to lose? I hate losing. It doesn't matter what we're talking about. Why would I ever want my wife to lose if I love her? Furthermore, why would I ever want to be the one who causes her to lose? Just because I've convinced myself that's the only way for me to win? Holmes, that's how Satan talks, not how God talks. Because it's impossible to win whenever your friend loses. Proverbs 18, verse 19, really powerful verse for this part of the conversation. An offended friend is harder to win back than a fortified city. Those are strong words. Arguments separate friends like a gate locked with bars. <laughs> I, I used to, oh my word, with my own brother. It, it was just all about winning. Now, one of the sweetest relationships I have in my life is, is or are the relationships I have with my two brothers. And my middle brother, because he, we're two years apart, my baby brother's eight years from me, and we're best friends. My middle brother is my best friend. But for years, because he was two years away from me, I always felt like we had to compete. And so because I thought everything was a competition, if we're in a competition, my goal is always to win. And it created such distance between me and my brother. <laughs> and I, I think about now, if I didn't have my middle brother, my life would be far less than what it is. He's not just one of my favorite people. He's one of the people that makes me me. And I just think back to the, the years where I relegated our relationship to a contest. And I just wanted to beat him. I just wanted to win every argument, every wrestling match. You can't be best friends with someone you're always trying to wrestle with. The 
only reason we try and wrestle is because we're just trying to win. Arguments separate friends like a gate locked with bars. And arguments create offended friends, and an offended friend is harder to win back than the most fortified city. This is serious stuff. Your goal to win in every one of your relationships is actually creating less relationships. So what is the goal? If winning isn't the goal, what is the goal? Growth. One of the goals of every relationship should be to grow. We want to grow closer. We want to grow stronger. We want to grow in love. We want to grow in grace. We want to grow in mercy. One of the goals of every relationship should be to grow. You've heard me say this before. Holly and I say this. This is how we've tried to live our lives. It's okay where you are today. Just, just don't be there tomorrow. Let's grow. It's okay. Like when we got married, Holly was, was like a complete just locked door emotionally and she wouldn't want to talk. But she went to work over the years. My favorite moments in my life are when that girl lays her head on my leg in bed and just starts talking out of her heart. Let's grow. Let's not try and beat each other. Let's try and grow with one another. And hardship in a relationship can lead to personal growth as well as more growth in the relationship. Both can take place. That's why we go to the gym. We tear down the muscle and it actually creates growth. I'm not saying you should create strife, okay? But I remember one time, one of my heroes, Holly and I were having dinner with them, husband and wife, and she said, Preston, I'm not sure anybody has a love the way we do. She was talking about her and her husband. And I said, really? You sound really confident. How can that be possible? And she said, because they haven't been through what we've been through. And chosen to continue to love one another the way we love one another. It blew my mind. And here's one of the sweetest people I've ever met in my life. And she's saying, there's been some hardship, but guess what? Those hardships led to hard growth. Not easy growth. It was hard growth because it was through hardship. But when we go through tough stuff, I don't know if you've ever learned this. If you've learned it yet, but you can be really, really frustrated with somebody for a, a, a very extended period of time. And then the fence gets mended. You work through the difficulty. And what happens? On the other side, you feel closer to the person than you did before the fight. I don't understand how it works. But even hardship, relational difficulty can help us grow relationally. Again, please hear what I'm saying. I'm not saying you should go and create strife in your relationships. Don't seek to create strife. Seek to grow in the things of the spirit as you go through strife. God wants to grow you. And he's not afraid to use hard things to do it. And he's not afraid to use hardship to do it. Some of the hardest things Holly and I have been through relationally have created the greatest measure of intimacy. Again, I don't know how it works, but I think there's something to extending grace to one another, choosing to love one another. And when we get on the other side, all of it just grows because you chose not to go the ungodly way to tear down. And when you take that approach, never be surprised when God builds up. And that brings us to the last thing as we talk about navigating relational hardship. Invite God in. 
Invite God in. I'm going to read you a passage that I read at every wedding I have ever done and ever will do. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 12. It says, a person standing alone can be attacked and defeated. Who wants that? I don't want to be attacked and defeated. So the Lord says, okay, Preston, if you don't want to be attacked and defeated, don't go alone. Watch this next part. But two can stand back to back, stink and conquer. I like to win now. Preston, if you like to win. In this battle, not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities, the unseen world. Lock up. Go too wide, my man. Watch what he says next. Three are even better. Or three, a cord of three strands, the way I memorized it, but a triple braided cord, the way the New Living says it, is not easily broken. A cord of three strands is not easily broken. Preston, what is a cord of three strands? Well, let's first understand what a cord of two strands is. A cord of two strands is just me and you. The fastest way for a relationship to be stretched beyond the limits of its strength is to settle for a two-strand relationship, just me and you. That is not a strong relationship, no matter how strong the two people in it are. Preston, what's a cord of three-strand relationship? Any relationship between two people where God is brought into the center of the relationship. Timmy and I have a lot in common. And then there are other areas where we're the exact opposite. But the thing at the center of our relationship isn't me isn't Timmy. It's God. It's the Lord. One of the strongest human relationships I have. Probably why it's one of the strongest is it's a relationship where God is most involved and is the center of the entire relationship. Preston, I can't forgive this person. You don't know what they've done to me. I get it. I get it. You know what will help you forgive them? Bring into the center of the relationship the one, capital O, who has already forgiven them. Preston, that's not what I want to hear. I get it. It's never what the flesh wants to hear. But you need to remember, it is what the spirit wants to say. Capital S. I think one of the reasons many of us don't bring God into our relationships is because deep down, we don't want to pay the cost the price of admission to have godly relationships. It's hard. It's expensive. It's sacrificial. You're going to have a quarter three strands marriage where God's in the center of the relationship. Let me help you understand how it's going to roll. God's going to go, hey, Preston, don't talk like that to her. Don't say something like that to her. Preston, don't, don't do that. She asked you to do something. Please get up and go do it. This, this is what's bad. In a court of three strands, this is what's scary. That when you're not doing something God's way, it is two V1. Them and God against you. Anytime I'm doing something that isn't being done God's way, he stands with them. He stands with Holly. He stands with Timmy. It says, Preston, sir, I, I can't stand on your side of the aisle right now because what you're doing isn't just wrong. It's antithetical to my ways. Husbands, treat your wives in the way in which you should so that the Lord will hear your prayers. Comes to mind. Preston, if you're being stupid over here, you need to know where I stand. I'm standing with Holly. So just know, I'm not telling you, well, bring God into your relationship. No, I'm, I'm trying to help you understand how hard it is, how expensive it is. And that's why most people don't bring God into the center of their relationships. Because any relationship where God is not the center means the flesh is. You know how easy it is to be in a fleshy relationship? You just do whatever you want. You say whatever you want. But in a relationship where God is at the center, his heart is always that we would do what he asks. 
that we would do what he desires. You want help? If you're in a relationship that's experiencing relational separation, bring God into it, to the very center of it. Pray more about that relationship. Listen, here, here's a great piece of advice. Every time you get frustrated with this per- person, you know what you should do? Pray for him. Preston, that's cheesy. And it's not just cheesy. And I don't think it is cheesy. It's bigger than that. It's hard. A friend and I were talking and we were navigating some, some relational difficulty. And we both said almost simultaneously, over the last couple of years, I haven't prayed more about anything than I've prayed more about this relationship. And when they said it, I said the same thing. I knew what they meant because I've prayed so much about it. Let me say it like this. It's actually kind of sweet. The more serious a relationship is to you, the more I think you'll pray about the relationship. My marriage is the most important thing to me in my life. How come you only pray about it like once every six weeks? The only two answers I can think of, it's either because it's not that important to you or because God isn't in the center of the marriage. Again, not trying to throw darts at anybody. But I am saying, the enemy loves division. He loves it. And because he loves it, We need to build the most godly, strong relationships we can. And you cannot build a strong, godly relationship without God in the center of it. The more important a relationship is to you, the more important it is to consistently bring the Lord into it. I know this is not the easiest of topics because relational pain is one of the heaviest pains. And that's part of love. It's part of loving a human who isn't perfect and never will be this side of heaven. And when you love, and somebody does something they shouldn't have done or said something they shouldn't have said, it's just really easy to be hurt by it. And so I I don't want to treat your heart or your hurt too lightly. But I do want to, as aggressively as the Lord will allow me to, I do want to come up into your business, kind of grab you by the ears and say, please don't let this go any longer. If there's something you need to own, own it. If there's something you need to repent about, repent of it. The two biggest things that help us have courageous conversations relationally, start it with honor and fall on the sword. I know you were hurt, but this root of bitterness is wreaking havoc in your life. And bitterness is a terrible blanket to fall asleep beneath. I want to pray over you, especially my brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, grandfathers, grandmothers in the faith who are right now presently in a relationship where there's separation because of pain misdeeds, and missteps. Holy Spirit, you are the comforter. Capital C, comforter. You're better than any blanket we will ever lie beneath. And I just pray right now, wherever they are, that you would cover my brothers and sisters who are in the middle of relational hardship, would you cover them with comfort? Holy Spirit, I pray you would step even further into the center of every relationship, 
that's going through hardship right now. God, you know there, there's hurt here. And Satan would love nothing more than the hurt to continue to fester and get worse. God, I pray right now that you would place your strong, gentle hand on any part of their heart where there's pain. God, would you tangibly touch them right now? And begin to heal the hurt. So that the next steps can be taken to heal the relationship. I come against every scheme of the enemy in Jesus' name. I break and sever every word, curse, and spell spoken over or against my brothers and sisters, knowingly or unknowingly, in Jesus' name. Satan is trying to wreak havoc. God, I pray my brothers and sisters would see you step in as the one having all power in heaven and on earth and do things nobody in their lives thinks can be done in this relationship. I pray for miracles. I, I pray for relationships that have been severed and separated for decades. I pray that the fences would be miraculously mended in Jesus' name. Enough is enough. But God, two humans can't heal the hurts in these two hearts. They need the God of the universe to intervene. And do what only he can do. Lord, I pray for phone calls and texts to go out all over the world for my brothers and sisters who sat at this table with you this last hour of their lives. Holy Spirit, would you divinely enable them to fire off just the right words, to send out the calls with just the right words that will be used by you to mend the fence, heal the hurt, and strengthen the relationship as they come back together with one another. God, thank you. Thanks for not just looking in our direction and saying, okay, go figure it out. Y'all figure this out. You want to be in the middle of every one of our relationships. Hardest way to be in a relationship is to be in one where you're not at the center. The easiest way to be an in intimate fellowship with someone is to have you at the center of the fellowship. Holy Spirit, would you cause everything you said to stick to the inner lining of their hearts and anything I said to just fall off their back like water on a duck's back. God, I pray for miracles, relational miracles that nobody thought would ever be possible. In Jesus' name. Amen. A stinking men. I'm so proud of you. I know this isn't easy. I know it's hard to navigate the hurt that you've had for a long time. I'm telling you, don't take Satan's bait. Love what God loves. Hate what God hates. He hates this division that you're experiencing in this relationship. Bring him into it. Let the Holy Spirit guide you on how to see the hurts healed. I love you so much. I'm praying for you. Jump in the comments. Jump in the DMs on Instagram. 
I love to pray with you and over you. Let me know if there's something, if there's a relationship, I can just be standing in agreement that God would heal. Let me know, all right? I love you so much, and I can't wait to see you next week. <laughs>